Thank you very much. Thank you, all, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, is that coming across okay, sound-wise? Um, and a, a special thanks to Raz, my friend, for <laughs> well, the, the tribulations involved in organising me in any in any way at all. Um, it's it's really I'm, I'm very glad to be glad to be here. Now, I'll get straight to my text because it's uh, uh, it's quite a long one, and I, and I, I have limited time. Um, would it be possible to get the map up on the? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just there. Yeah. Okay. You don't need to worry about the particulars of this map. <clears throat> really, what matters is the sort of is the scale and shape and focus of it. Um, this is broadly speaking the greater Europe of which I'm talking today. When I talk about greater Europe, this is really what I mean. Up the Ural Mountains in the Caucasus region and through to Central Asia. Another part of the, that I will talk about a little, <coughs> will be Central Asia here today, but most of my talk will centre on this, uh, uh, you know, on the areas in the middle and to the east of, the, uh, to, to the right-hand side of that map as you look at it. Uh, what, I might, what I'll call a greater Europe, or a kind of Eurasian space. Uh, and I'll justify that as I go on. Uh, my premise is this, the Holocaust is a European crime as well as a German crime. The final solution, so-called, uh, occurs in an age of genocide and ethnic cleansing. Now, I tend to see the Holocaust as an only partly discrete episode, and weigh each of those elements equally, discrete in some ways, not discrete in others, an only partly discrete episode within a wider process of continental restructuring. Mine is an attempt today to marry the study of what, what we might call ethnopolitics um, with geopolitics and with straightforward politics. And to do all of that within an overall framework that encapsulates something about this territory's experience of high or late modernity. So the geopolitical parameters of this space are, as you see in some ways, they're provided, this is a space that's both time-bound and space-bound, you know, bounded by geography in some ways, but also chronology. The parameters, geopolitically speaking, of this space are provided first by the crises and dissolution of the older multinational empires, the Ottoman, Roman, often Habsburg empires, from the late 19th century onwards. And that's the picture from the late 19th century to the mid-20th century, really. Then we have the establishment in the wake of these empires of a string of insecure and heterophobic new nation-states. Then we have the intrusion of three new imperial influences into the contested spaces vacated by the old empires. Hmm. Fascist Italy, to some extent, tries to step into the shoes of the Ottoman Empire in the eastern Mediterranean. The Soviet Union tries to contests for and tries to expand and re-expand some of the spaces of the old Tsarist Empire. And particularly for today's purposes, the Third Reich, the German Empire, which expands into some of the Habsburg space and contests uh, former Romanov space too. These contested spaces were the, pla were the places where, for the most part, the most violent population politics were enacted during the Second World War era. But they were also the site of other such violence. Not at quite the same level, but I think in some sense related, especially through the effective end of the Ottoman Empire in mainland Europe uh, in what is often called the Eastern Crisis of 1875 to 1878. So that's the geopolitics of the matter. Now the politics of the matter are, are manifold. Uh, two aspects I think are especially salient. The first is that the, uh, the new imperial forms were themselves shaped by new ideological norms, giving a particular colouring to the expansion and consolidation of their empires. My second point, though, runs somewhat counter to that, which is that different though the fascist and Bolshevik empires are to the pre previous dynastic uh, land-based empires, different though they are in some ways, they're still confronted with some of the same problems. They're born into a world of greater and lesser powers, 
some of these lesser powers they sought to incorporate within their own spheres of influence. And the lesser powers in turn decided or rescinded their alliance or neutrality status according to established European tenets of survival and advantage, the great vicious European game. In short, in contrast, I, th I suppose, in some contrast to a sort of bloodlands type analysis, um, which concentrates especially on totalitarian regimes <clears throat> and the space between the Nazi and Soviet empires, um, I want to focus on a whole range of ostensibly different regimes and actors, a much broader cast of characters across a slightly larger space of time and across a significantly larger <coughs> chronological reign of time too. So as to ethnopolitics, the, fi the final of my three um, pillars, well, ethnopolitics were manifold, and they also include what we might call ethnoeconomics, and I'll talk about that more later. As to ethnopolitics, barely an ethnic group in Europe escaped some sort of discrimination or, or actual violence levelled at it in this period. But the geopolitical com context also houses the interface of the three great monotheistic religions, and it's a widely overlooked aspect of this period, except insofar as the question is reduced to Christian anti-Semitism, which turns out to be the most violent of all of the prejudices. It's a widely overlooked aspect of the period that most of the most, many of the most vicious intergroup dynamics at this time of geo geopolitical flux from the mid-19th century onwards were superimposed on religious cleavages. This was true for the different Christian sects in the Polish-Ukrainian and also Hungarian and Ruthenian conflicts, as well as the Croatian and Serbian conflicts, just as for the Muslim-Christian dynamics and the, I, I won't even call it a dynamic, the, the extermination, the attempts at extermination of Jews by Christians. Parenthetically, one thing that strikes me as interesting about this period is that there's relatively little violence between Protestants and Catholics in this period. There's, there's violence between Catholics and Eastern Catholics. There's violence between Orthodox and, um, and non-Orthodox. But there's comparatively little violence. And even, you know, I say this coming from Scotland and in the area of Ireland where Protestant Catholic troubles and violence have been part of the landscape. It's still at a relatively low level compared to the huge explosion of violence along other religious cleavages. And uh, why that would be, uh, my tentative suggestion is that somehow the Reformation and Thirty Years' War somehow sorted that out. Can't really put it in any blunter way than that. Now, it's heuristically useful to divide my broad timescale into three periodizations, each with its own primary victim group. The greatest ethno-religious violence of the second half of the 19th century had Muslims as its victims. As Tsarist Russia expanded into formerly Ottoman land in the Crimea and the Caucasus, and as the new Balkan states on the south of the Balkan Peninsula established themselves in violence. Some of this anti-Muslim violence is perpetuated into the First World War period too. I'll talk more about that in a moment, but the obsession of the, of the French army in the, Volta, the upper Volta region, for instance, in the First World War, resulted in absolutely enormous reprisal massacres against the inhabitants of um, of the upper Volta region, you know, the, the borderlands between uh, Mali and Burkina, partly because they perceived the Muslims to be engaged in a grand conspiracy against, uh, an Islamic conspiracy against Christian rule, believe it or not. Some of the dynamics of some other episodes will bear some resemblance to this. Um, so the Muslims are the primary victims of the late 19th century, or second half of the 19th century. Then it was the turn of the Ottoman Christians to suffer the most extreme violence in the first quarter of the 20th century. The Armenians and Assyrians suffered waves of massacre culminating in genocide in 1915 to 16. At the end of the First World War era, the internationally sponsored ethnic cleansing of <coughs> Muslims from uh, Greece and Orthodox subjects from, uh, from Turkey was the last major bout of uh, Muslim Christian violence until the murder of tens of thousands of Bosnian Muslims by Serbian Chetniks in the Second World War, and then the violence against Yugoslav Muslims after the Cold War. In the Second World War era, Jews, the European Jews, were the pre preeminent victims of ethnic violence, having already suffered greatly at the hands of the Tsarist regime in 1915, and again during the Russian Civil War. <coughs> 
Now, whatever the, its intriguing macro-level patterns, this violence is obviously not all of the same intensity or direction. Um, broadly, we might say that the fate of Muslims in Christian Russia and the Balkans was of ethnic cleansing, that is, removal from a particular geographical space or political geographical space from one into another geographical space, in this case, Turkish Anatolia. The fate of the Muslims was ethnic cleansing, we might say. And we might say of the Christians that their fate the fate of Christians in the Ottoman Empire was of mass murder or genocide, but confined to a particular political or geographic space, namely the interior of the perpetrator state. Then we come to the, the Holocaust. The, the, the murder of the Jews was clearly a case of genocide, but it was also a case of genocide exceeding the interior of the perpetrator state and exceeding even the lands directly ruled by the perpetrator state. So that you know, a, a series of important differences that I'll part, try to account for during this lecture. On the other hand, I should say this, and my approach, I don't regard myself as a comparative genocide scholar any longer. I used to think of myself as a comparative genocide scholar. I now regard myself as a sort of scholar of connected genocides or interrelations between different episodes. I'm not so interested in saying, here's one genocide, here's another. You know, here's an apple, here's a pear, great, there's some fruit. You know, I'm interested in sort of talking about shared patterns of causation. Uh, correlations in precise you know, spatio-temporal areas. And I think comparative genocide studies has been too preoccupied with legislating on differences between cases, especially insofar as this concerns the relationship between the Holocaust and other genocides on one hand, or on the other hand, between genocides and non-genocidal mass killing or eviction. It seems to me that such approaches are rather sterile from my perspective, which is concerned with balances of the general and the particular. Uh, I suspect the historian, or at least this historian, is probably left with something like Wittgenstein's concept of family resemblances, of things that bear some similarities in certain areas but not in others. And it seems to me that family resemblances are more respectful than any kind of regimented typology of what might Mark Twain called uh, the ragged edges of truth. Well, what follows is an, attempt, is, is an approach that is contextual in, exp in, in exposing the shared framework of violence against A, Muslims, B, Christians, then C, Jews, but also in some sense uh, comparative or contrastive in accounting for the violent progression through these cases. You know, why each of those cases, A, B is more violent than A and C is more violent than B, and thinking about what, what, each of those what light each of those cases may, sh may shed on the succeeding one, right? Let's start with Muslims, very briefly here. The, the basic condition of the expulsion of Muslims was change in the over, overlordship of the territories from which it was conducted. Expulsions from the Crimea and the North Caucasus uh, in, the, in, the 19, in the 1850s and 60s came with the consolidation of Russian rule in territory conquered from the Ottoman Empire. The expulsions from the Balkan um, nation states varied in motivation over time. Combining, especially in the first instance, a sort of Christian chauvinism, um, as also in the Russian case, with, in the Balkan case, resentment against a people, i.e. Muslims, uh, historically associated with dominance. Increasingly, from the very late 19th century onwards, we see a desire to reshape the demographic map in these Balkan states in perpetuity to create more ethnically homogeneous nation states. Given the transnational nature of Muslim violence, the number of different state and actors and non-state actors too, I think we can cl conclude in some way that the perpetration of anti-Muslim violence was in some sense civilizational. Given the, the combined total of refugees created during Russian expansion through the Caucasus and the Crimea and the expulsion of Muslims from the Balkan Peninsula, um, may have been up to 5 million people between the 1850s and the 1920s. And if those sequences don't quite reach the proportions of unequivocal genocide, then murder is obviously still an important aspect of this process, partly to encourage others to leave, and partly because of the simple potential for escalation that was intrinsic to such actions. The opening of a window for the settling of scores, for plunder, for sadism. All of this intrinsic to the process of intercommunal uh, polarization. Moreover, there was at least one borderline case of possible genocide, and here I refer to the Tsarist so-called pacification and expulsion of the Circassians of the North Caucasus 
from the early 1860s. The death toll associated there with conquest, counter-insurgency and expulsion was perhaps 300,000 people. One context for the most radical measures was the earlier Crimean War, and the tributary allegation was that the Circassians, like the Crimean Tatars, who were equally evicted, had sympathies with the Ottoman Empire and even Britain. Now, these episodes encapsulate some of the dynamics that led to a definite instance of genocide during the First World War, when the embattled Ottoman Empire was the perpetrator. And this brings us to the fate of Christians. The deportation of the Armenians in 1915 was justified by the ruling Ottoman Committee of Union and Progress as a state security measure enacted in light of Armenian wartime subversion and allegiance to the empire's wartime <laughs> opponents, namely... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I thought it was going to make some reference to Mao and draining the sea in which the <laughs> counterinsurgents. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, it's enacted as, as a supposedly, as, uh, allegedly, it's justified as a state security measure, these deportations, in light of Armenian alleged subversions, subversion and allegiance to the <laughs> empire's wartime opponents, Britain and Russia. As with Russian policy towards the Crimean Tatars, the sort of enemy picture here, the fine build as the Germans would call it, is one of an inner enemy in league with an outer enemy. The inner mi internal minority graining strength as the, the fifth column of a larger force. For the first time in war, in the 1918 conflict, the Ottoman Empire was ranged against both the powers, Britain and Russia, uh, uh, sorry, Britain and France, who were traditionally posed as friends of the Armenians, and had interfered in the Ottoman Empire's internal affairs. And that's the, the, one of the longer term contexts for this inner enemy, outer enemy association, uh, was this broader context of the decline of the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century, um, the violence enacted to address this decline, the Ottoman determination to secure sovereign control of remaining Ottoman territory in the rump of Anatolia, the territory of modern day Turkey, while losing territory in the Balkans, North Africa, and the Caucasus. Um, retaining that territory, increasingly thought of as the heartland of the Ottoman Empire, Anatolia, where most of the Armenians lived in the east, that was seen as an absolute priority for the Ottoman elites. Potentially separatist populations were viewed with increasing suspicion. Like Jews in Europe, Christians in the Ottoman state had long been culturally stereotyped based on ideas of economic exploitation <coughs> and transnational affiliation uh, and have been subject to abuses based on their alleged religious inferiority. These traditional abuses provided the sort of locus or the justification for great power intervention on behalf of the minorities, while the stereotypes provided the template into which new uh, nationalist and almost sometimes almost racist, but certainly ethno-religious conceptions of their allegedly dangerous otherness could fit. A vicious circularity was established. The notion that Armenian Christians had broken the compact with the Muslim state and the inherently superior Muslim population by appealing to the powers for protection um, was an absolutely key moment. Now here I'm thinking particularly of the conclusion of the so-called Eastern Crisis of 1875-8, to as the Ottoman Empire loses all of these Balkan territories. At that moment, the Armenians appeal to, for protection in Eastern Anatolia to Russia and Britain and are granted it in some measure in the terms of the 1878 Berlin Treaty. This is an absolutely key moment in the deterioration of relations between the Armenian minority and the state that led to the massacres of around 80,000 Armenians in 1894-6. The First World War increased the sense of Ottoman existential crisis, but it also complicated the issue of what to do with the Armenians uh, in their eastern Anatolian homelands, which bordered Russia. As late as the beginning of May 1915, during the First World War, obviously, one Ottoman general proposed evicting Armenians from the border provinces into Russia, pushing them over the border as one possible option amongst others. The idea was taken no further. Why? Because the Ottoman elite felt that if you, did, if you, if you already perceived that there was some sort of confraternity between Russians and Armenians, if you then pushed the Armenians into the Russian arms, they would just return in numbers, join the Russian army, and then, and then return back into Ottoman uh, um, Eastern Anatolia armed and prepared to take over the land. That was the logic of the thinking. So within one week from the beginning of May, the direction of eviction was finally decided, not northwards or, e or 
northeastwards into Russian territory. It would be southwards to the internal exile of the deserts of present-day Syria and Iraq. Outside Anatolia, beyond the line of the Baghdad railway to the south, into the Arab lands, or outside of the Ottoman Turkic heartland into the Arab lands. The deportation measures quickly became more extensive as from late May 1915 through the summer, deportation spread from the border regions of Persian Azerbaijan, Persia and Russia through the whole of eastern Anatolia and westwards even into European Thrace. Many of the deportees were massacred and abused on a colossal <coughs> scale, um, especially by paramilitaries, gendarmes and especially um, also Kurdish tribes loyal to the government. Nevertheless, the destinations of the deportations remain significant. Prior to the war, Circassian refugees from successive refugee movements in the late 19th century had been settled also in some of these arid areas of desert, where infrastructure was absent and settlers were liable to be attacked by nomadic Bedouins. The mortality had been great even in peacetime and with some effort by the government at, at assisting the Circassian refugees. No such efforts were obvious in the First World War context. The Committee of Union and Progress knew that deporting Armenians to these inhospitable areas was akin to a death sentence for many in the medium term at most. Given general wartime shortage, even that term was liable to be sharply, sharply reduced. This specific sort of removal was the most straightforward way of rendering Armenians harmless in the immediate term getting them out of the Anatolian heartland and then, in the longer term, preventing them returning. It also allowed the state and local Muslim notables to appropriate, i.e. steal, a huge amount of residential property and commercial capital throughout Anatolia from the Armenians, according to the burgeoning doctrine of mili iktisat, or national economy, copying a model of, to a certain extent copying a model of the German Friedrich List. The idea that for a modernising state that wanted to compete and fight in the world as it was, you needed a strong bourgeoisie, but it had to be a trustworthy bourgeoisie, one that you could build on and rely upon, and Christians were not fitted to that role. You needed an indigenous Muslim bourgeoisie. So part of this huge process of murder and deportation is also a massive process of theft and capital transfer to a supposedly more reliable, um, nascent Muslim, Muslim bourgeoisie. Okay, so now we come to, to the Holocaust. And I want to split this actually into two phases. The murder of the Jews here. We've got, on one hand, let's, I'll call it Germany and the final solution. Mm -hmm. And then I'll come to a second section which we'll call Europe and the final solution. I'll begin with Germany and the final solution. The policies that culminated in total genocide um, began with a spatial goal, the emigration of Jews from Germany. On the conquest of Poland and France and then the invasion of the Soviet Union, increasingly ambitious and speculative Jew Jewish so-called reservation plans were, were mooted, whether for Polish Lublin, Madagascar, or in 1941, uh, somewhere in the Soviet Ostraum, the Soviet interior, either behind the, the Urals or possibly to the Great North, the Arctic Circle. Anyway, some, some area of the ter Soviet territory that's projected to be conquered. Speculative plans, some with more meat and grist than others, but, you know, further evidence of an enduring kind of spatial sense. These were designed for spatial removal, albeit that mass death was very obviously built into them, even from a relatively early stage, from as early as 1939. As with Ottoman Armenian policy in 1915, getting Jews out, as it were, of the salient cultural stroke ge geographical space and having them die cannot always be conceptually separated. Um, if you think, I'm mean, here when I talk about cultural geographical spaces, for instance, the idea of expelling Jews beyond the Ural Mountains tells us a very great deal since the Urals were somehow thought of as the, the you know, the outer eastern perimeter of, of greater Europe, right? This concept of a, a geographical and cultural, a space that's at once geographical and cultural too. Yeah, right. When mass, con when concerted mass murder of, of Jews begins with the first SS killings uh, in the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, these coexisted for a while, at least with the idea of a Soviet, of a spatial solution somewhere in the Soviet interior, perhaps. Those first SS killings, however horrific their scope, should be taken on the terms in which they were conducted. Murder in the first instance of adult male Soviet Jews began immediately on the invasion. 
but it was not initially intended as a way of murdering or wiping out immediately all Jews in the Soviet space. And subsequent escalation was, was not planned from the beginning. It was inherent in some way in the logic of being there. That's a different thing. This was a paranoid, if you like, pseudo race, um, you know, racist security policy in inverted commas. The aim of which was decapitate from the Nazi perspective, right? From the Nazi view, was decapitating the Jewish community, and also with it the, su the supposed Judeo-Bolshevik state. You know, the idea that Jew the well-known idea that Jews and Bolsheviks were one and the same, um, the former somehow manipulating the latter. Even when total murder, i.e. murder not just of adult men and adult women and families, but of whole communities, even from the autumn of 1941 onwards, even when that total murder was established in the Soviet Union after a few months, this was still specific at this point to Soviet territory. What then of the Jews further west in Poland and the, and the greater so-called German Reich itself? Well, if literal removal remained the priority for, in some sense, literally just getting Jews out of those sp spaces, particularly Germany, then the trajectory of the war, disappointing from the Nazi perspective from the very end of 1941 onwards, happily for everyone else, um, in the longer term, that trajectory of the war meant that um, if removal of Jews from that space, the German space, was to happen, it had to be by different means than the removal of Muslims from Europe, which is a rough equivalent of forcing Jews out of Germany earlier, in the 1930s, and it also had to be by different means than the dumping of Anatolian Christians into the desert, which was the rough equivalent of, the, say, the Madagascar rev uh, reservation plan. Right. The deportation of Jews from the Reich itself, Greater Germany, was driven by German regional leaders seeking to remove Jews from their areas out of a combination of an ideological desire to become uh, Judenrein, cleansed of, uh, of Jews, and also out of a competitive desire to do this at least as quickly as anybody else to prove your ideological purity. The question of whether German Jews um, should be murdered outright was not settled by the decisions of autumn 1941 to deport German Jews eastwards. Yeah, while Soviet Jews are being massacred wholesale, the regular systematic massacre, mass murder of deportees from Germany and even the Czech lands and Austria and parts of France, the regular systematic mass murder of these deportees did not begin until uh, late spring 1942. What these deportations from Germany into Poland and the Soviet spaces did was to add to the logistical problems on the ground in Poland and the Soviet Union, where initiatives of regional civilian administrations and SS leaders were vital. Thus, in the broader context of uh, radicalization created by the German-Soviet war and the escalation of murder in the Soviet territories, Autumn 1941 saw the beginning of a series of initiatives in Poland to establish murder facilities to dispose of indigenous, i.e. Polish, ghettoized Jews who were too ill, young or old to work. This was done obviously for its own ideological sake, but also to make space for incoming Jews from the West, from the Reich itself. The dynamic was established of a constant sifting of the Jewish population for murder in which overcrowding of ghettos, food rationing, deliberately low, and disease amongst the Jews captive in the ghettos all served as important proximate motivations for murder, self-created German problems that had, had in some sense to be solved, in inverted commas, by the most radical measures. If these dynamics of radicalization are approximately accepted, and you could pick, pick and argue all of them, but you know, if you're approximately accepted, um, they account in some sense and here again, I put this in inverted commas, they account only for the murder of Jews within Germany's expanded borders. A huge number of people, but still within a defined space. And I take Germany's expanded borders to denote Germany's Eastern Empire, Soviet territories and Polish territories, plus Greater Germany itself, and the lands annexed to it from 1937 to 41. I would also add the Netherlands, which is scheduled to be incorporated and from which nearly completely successful deportations began in the second half of 1942. Now, that is the, the centre of, of, of the Nazi genocide of, of European Jewry. You know, it accounts for the vast majority of its victims and massive in scale and unprecedented in intensity. Um, however extreme all of this is, 
um, in some sense, and only in one sense, for the comparativist, the comparative historian of genocide, genocide within a bounded sovereign territory itself doesn't set Germany apart, interestingly. Um, indeed, some of the more sort of, if we might call it conventional genocidal logic of securing the rear against fifth columns, all purely imaginary, but in the perpetrator's mindset, some of this kind of conventional logic of genocide, securing a certain bounded territory, can be detected as late as October 1943 in SS leader Heinrich Himmler's infamous Posen speeches, uh, in which he celebrates the near completion of the so-called, what he called the evacuation of the Jews. And he said, and I quote in that speech, in one of these Posen speeches, I quote, we know how difficult we would have made it for ourselves if on top of the bombing raids, the burdens and the deprivations of war, we still had Jews today in every town as secret saboteurs, agitators and troublemakers. We would now probably have reached the 1916 to 17 stage, unquote. He's referring, of course, to the sort of collapse of German morale and problems on the home front, and very much referring to Fish, too. <laughs> um, this was the language of perceiving an inner enemy hmm, within the German sphere that had to be removed from German territories. But what about the aspect of the, of, of the final solution of the Jewish question, so-called, that has contributed to its so contributed to its particular notoriety, and which makes it so radical even by the standards of other genocides. The question I'm talking about here is not just why eviction from a particular German ruled space or why mass murder within that space, but why mass murder even beyond the space that you rule. My answer here entails moving towards an account of the Holocaust that is placed within a wider and longer process of violent European reconstruction or restructuring. In this process, as I intimated at the outset, Nazi Germany is clearly the major driving force for most of the time and often the coordinator, but not always. And here we have to pay great attention. Here I refer to the work of Raz in particular and others who are working on the initiative of non-Nazi states, other states in the Balkans and elsewhere in Europe, who are very much working on their own initiative and not to be seen in some sense as Hitler's henchmen just doing what the Nazis want, but have their own agendas that are driven by their own preoccupations with borders, population homogene homogeneity, uh, economic development, and so on and so forth. These other states actually sometimes provided more than willing collaboration, sometimes they even set the pace, but they also decided when they would, would retract, retract their collaboration too, and that also influenced the, the dynamics uh, of the German-led genocide. So this brings me to the final section of the paper. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, you know, we talked about Germany and the final solution. Now I want to talk about Europe and, and, the, and the Holocaust. As with Muslims earlier and ethnic Germans later, if one thinks about it, transnational violence against Jews and, and of course, also Romanies was facilitated because the, these victim groups were targets upon whom many European nationalists could agree without much fear of contradiction by domestic and international co-participants. Right? ethnic Germans after the war, Muslims in the 1870s through the 1890s, Jews and Romanies during the Second World War. These are all victim groups who almost universalized others at this point. There's you know, you're not, not actually going to be any international opposition within, in the countries that matter within Europe. To, to, you know, this is why it's a European-wide crime. Jews and Romanies were the victims of a particularly channeled international persecution at a time when alliance politics and German preferences inhibited violence against uh, certain other minorities, at least for a while, say Ukrainians or Hungarians in, Ru Ru in Romanian territory or uh, ethnic Germans anywhere outside of territory still ruled by the Soviet Union. Of course, ethnic Germans within Soviet territory were deported during the war. Um, now, this particular channeling of violence against certain groups, especially Jews, this was true even where local dynamics um, not involving Jews had greater political or local political immediacy than relations between Jews and non-Jews. As for instance with the Ukrainian nationalists who were primarily anti-Russian, anti-Soviet and also anti-Polish, yet spent much of 1941 to 1942 murdering almost the entirety of Volhynian Jewry under German command. Why were Jews perceived as such a common enemy there and then? Well, a simple glance at European history would tell you the approximate answer is the uh, one proximate answer, one immediate answer is the Bolshevik Revolution. If also Bolshevik expansion at the end of the First World War and in 1939. 
Right across the continent, the Bolshevik Revolution stim stimulated virulent expressions of anti-Semitism along well-established tropes of Jews as conspirators, underminers of Christian civilization, um, and so on and so forth. We know the story. But the Bolshevik Revolution also fitted into a pre-existing set of perceptions that Jews were beneficiaries of industrial commercial modernity, alongside them being beneficiaries of uh, ruptures in Europe's social order that began with, say, the egalitarianizing, secular, secularizing rhetoric of the French Revolution and found mid and late 19th century political expression through the rise of liberalism and the European left. And also this rising anti-Semitism, the, the idea that Jews are beneficiaries of a liberal uh, commercial industrial modernity found economic expression uh, at the time of rural, especially rural um, depression from 1873 uh, to 1896, you know, with anti-Semitism rising broadly as stock markets fall at that point. Also, I think, significant or of a lesser degree of significance, but, but relevant in some ways too, in terms of the upshot of upsurge of European anti-Semitism in the late 19th, early 20th century, are the minorities treaties imposed on the lesser European powers in 1878 and 1918 to 23, as they emerged from the shell of dynastic empires. Indeed, Romania's react reaction to the religious equality clauses, clauses in the 1878 Berlin Treaty were very similar to the Ottoman reactions to the Armenian clauses in that selfsame treaty. Nazi Germany's agenda was obviously important, this goes without saying. Um, as a regional great power, it had played on ethnic antagonisms as a way of fracturing the Paris peace settlement, as in Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. German anti-Semitism also radiated outwards, legitimating ra radical elements in eastern and, and southeastern Europe um, and influencing the adoption of anti-Semitic legislation beyond Germany in the later 1930s through 1941. But Germany could only encourage what was already there, and the independent states concerned only went as far as was in their own interests. These interests were especially tied up with geopolitics. Germany succeeded in gaining the alliance of states that had emerged from the First World War with territorial losses. As Germany divided up Eastern and Southeastern Euro uh, Europe um, in some time partnership with the Soviet Union, it was in a position to reverse a number of the World War I boundary awards with Hungary and Bulgaria gaining territory at the expense of Romania, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia and Greece. Romania also lost Bessarabia and Bukovina to the adjoining Soviet Union. As territory changed hands, any so-called foreign populations dwelling in it were in danger from their new masters. They were in danger because they were seen as political grounds for these minority populations, were seen as potential grounds for future irredentist claims by recently dis dispossessed states. But they were also in danger because as non-co-nationals in these newly acquired territories, they were simply distrusted. And because since territory was only recently acquired or reacquired, there were often fewer issues of citizenship and fewer ties of residual compassion to concern oneself with. Bulgaria, for instance, followed up its acquisition of Dobrudja from Romania with the exchange of Bulgarians and Romanians between the two states and was later prepared to allow Germany to murder Jews from the Macedonian and Thracian territories acquired from Greece and Yugoslavia. In summer 1941, Hungary evicted into the Ukraine Jews from the areas it acquired from Slovakia and forced some refugees from German rule into Polish eastern Galicia, where they, from which they had fled. Romania followed suit. The desire to regain the territory it had just lost led it to join the German alliance under a more radical leadership, right? just lost Bessarabia and Bukovina to the Soviet Union, consequent to the German-Soviet alliance. Um, as Germany invades the Soviet Union, Romania joins it in, in occupation, regains Bessarabia and Bukovina from the Soviet Union in the invasion of summer 1941. Part of that process, Romania expelled and murdered, or let die, most of the Jews of these two regions, along with many of the Jews of Transnistria, which it gained at the end of August, and which also became a reception point for Jewish refugees from Bessarabia and Bukovina. Staggering levels of murder by the R Romanian state, all on its own initiative. Perhaps 300,000 uh, Jews murdered or let die in this process. Some of Germany's allies proved less discriminating between categories of Jew in terms of where they lived. Right? Most obviously I'm thinking here of Slovakia and Croatia. Relatively small populations, but compared to some other countries there, but 
a huge, a extremely high proportion of those Jews murdered or surrendered to be murdered. And when the very high proportions of these Jewish populations killed or surrendered are compared with proportions of Jews surrendered independently by Germany's other allies, these two states, Croatia and Slovakia, look actually more like the exception than the rule as far as independent states are concerned, i.e. not states within Germany's direct imperial zone. That the Slovak Tiso regime let Germany do its dirty work should not conceal the desire to cleanse the Slovakian economy, in inverted commas of course, cleanse the economy, and ultimately society in the name of what the Slovaks called Christianization as well as Slovakization. Again, that religious motif coming through strongly, uh, even in an age of so-called purely ethno-nationalism and racial thinking. Yeah? Surrender into German hands fulfilled a social goal for the Slovaks that might otherwise have been hi hindered by reluctant recipient states. Uh, surrender into German hands of Slovakia's Jews removed a people who were considered now a burden precisely because of the Slovak, Slovak state's earlier measures of enforced discriminatory impoverishment against Jews. Right? Yes, the, the, the Slovak state expropriates its Jews, takes their property, discriminates against them, and lo and behold, they become a burden on the economy. As a burden on the economy, uh, and as uh, increasingly seen as a foreign, foreign element, one of the easiest solutions is then simply to remove them, surrender them to Germany. But the SS did not force this design on Slovakia, they did not force the, the deportation of the Slovakian Jews to their deaths in Lublin and later at Auschwitz. It didn't force that on Slovakia. It prompted and facilitated that, but it received distinct recipro reciprocal engagement and encouragement from the Slovak state. This, if you like to, if you like to use the expression, this is a genocidal synergy right, between Germany and Slovakia. Now, why Croatia and Slovakia is an interesting question. Why those two states should have surrendered such a high proportion of their Jews relative to other independent states? Well, because the salient, there aren't, you know, there aren't there. What are the similarities between these two states? The salient similarity is certainly not special obedience to Germany. Clearly, the Ostasha could hardly be conceived to be obedient to anybody. Um, in relation to the territorial issue that's occupied so much in my talk, I, I'm going to speculate something here. I have no evidence actually to support this at all, but I'm speculating, right, as to why it might be that these two states surrendered such an unusually high proportion of their Jews for murder. My speculation is this, that each, as an entirely new state on the map in this period, right, didn't exist in the interwar period, either Slovakia or Croatia, the creations of the Nazi carve-up of Europe, uh, as entirely new states on the map, with little legitimacy in the eyes of the world beyond the Axis powers, each of these states' leadership was of the mind to create a sort of ethnic or ethno-religious fait accompli where and when it could. In an important sense, the whole of each territory of each of these new states presented the same sort of license for innovation, uh, sort of tabula rasa, as did the so-called regained parts of Romania, Hungary, and Bulgaria. Right, speculation over. There were other ways in which German and non-German anti-Semitic agendas could coalesce in genocide. The first of the SS Einsatzgruppen to progress to the murder of Soviet Jews of all ages and both sexes did so in the context of local collaboration in killing in the occupied Baltic. Without collaboration from Lithuanians, Latvians, Ukrainians, and to a slightly lesser extent Belarusians, the final solution simply could not have ach achieved the dimensions it did in the occupied Soviet territories. Tens of thousands of people lending their, putting their shoulders to the wheel. Independent states could also take the lead. On the 19th of August 1941, Hitler not only suggested that Europe was presenting what he called a united front uh, um, against, against European Jewry, he also suggested that the Romanian leader, Jan Antonescu, was showing the way by being more radical than Germany had been so far. Hitler was referring to Romania's killings in Bessarabia and Bukovina, which was greater at that point than the SS police murder in neighbouring German-controlled Ukraine. Barely a week after Hitler's reflections on Romania, another tributary of radicalisation materialised. And that also originated in um, population movement across borders. Um, it stemmed from the inadvertent but important interaction between the demographic policies of different Axis states. At the end of August 1941, what the German scholar Klaus uh, Michael Malmann calls a qualitative leap occurred in the murder of Ukrainian Jewry. A massacre of about 23,600 people was conducted at Kamenets Podolsky by forces under the regional higher SS and police leader. 
that massacre itself more than doubled the entire death toll inflicted by all SS and police agencies in that region to that point. Why did it happen? Well, the proximate causes were the so-called problems of overcrowding and people management in the region. And these so-called problems that the, the massacre was introduced to solve have been partly created by Hungary. Many of the Jews have been expelled from Hungary's formerly Slovakian acquisitions. Jews who have been forced back into eastern Galicia by Hungarian forces also compounded overcrowding in the ghettos of that district and so contributed to the reasons by which the local SS and police leader um, Katzman ordered the killing of what he called superfluous Jews at Stanislavov in, in eastern Galicia in mid-October 1941. This massacre of around 10,000 people was the first massacre on anything like its scale in, in the general government region of Poland to which Galicia had been annexed after the invasion of the Soviet Union. Eastern Galicia is in that sense very important. Uh, it was held when, the, when the Germans and the Soviets divided Poland in 1939, Eastern Galicia was put into the, put into the Russian territory. Uh, when the Germans invade Soviet Union in 1941, they reattach Galicia to the general government area of Poland. As such, it becomes a sort of policy bridge of radicalization between the Soviet Union and Poland. Right? And almost exactly the same time as the Stanislavov massacre of October 1941, the decision was made for the establishment of the extermination centre Belgets. Located on the border of the Lublin district and eastern Galicia, this camp was firstly to murder most of the Jews of southeastern Poland. If Belgets' construction had nothing to do with external relations, both the scholars Peter Klein and Peter Longerich argue that its sister camp in Lublin, Sobibor, was decided upon late in October 1941, creation of it, was decided upon in that time partly because of Himmler then offering to receive Jews from Slovakia. If this is correct, and we already have seen that this explanation needs to be em embedded in Slovakian push factors as well as German pull factors. <coughs> Germany's expanding ambition of deportations into its eastern empire was influenced by yet another modality of interaction between states. From the end of October 1941, this crucial month, the German Foreign Office approached three of the states recently mentioned, Romania, Croatia and Slovakia, about the possibility of deporting Jews of their citizenship who happened to be living on German soil. The deportation of those Jews would help fulfil deportation quotas of German Jews bound for Poland. In retrospect too, it set a precedent for later, more extensive deportations from some of those states themselves, having effectively agreed to the principle of, of deporting their, su their, their subjects. Slovakia, Romania and Croatia all agreed in principle to the deportations, not caring less about the people involved, only about securing the proceeds of their deportation, their money, you know, what was left behind, their property. My question is, well, how did Germany not just come to facilitate the destruction of other countries' Jewish populations, as with Slovakia, but to drive that process? Um, Obviously, German ideology, particularly as funneled through the most radical of its organisations, the SS, is a necessary part of the answer, but it's also an insufficient part of the answer. The rest of the answer, I think, lies with those German organisations that's had something to gain by capitalising on the opportunities that the European continent had just presented for the Europeanisation of the final solution. Right? This genocidal synergy that I've been talking about at this moment of late 1941. The diplomatic convergence with Romania, Slovakia and Croatia helps explain the certainty of Reich Security Head Office Chief Reinhard Heydrich and the Foreign Office Representative Martin Luther at the Wannsee Conference of January 1942. Luther proclaimed to see, foresee no great difficulties in getting the western um, and southwest and southwestern states of Europe to surrender their Jews. Um, I think that actually must mean western, western and southeastern states of Europe to surrender their Jews. The significance of Heydrich's and Luther's offices that these were the two organisations, the Reich Security Head Office and the Foreign Office, whose influence in Jewish policies was heavily invested in its extension beyond Germany's empire. This is obviously true of the Foreign Office, it can only be dealing with other countries. So if it wants a, 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 to take part in this horrendous game for influence, it needs to look beyond Germany's empire. But it's also true to a significant degree of the Reich Security Head Office, partly because of the gradual marginalisation of <coughs> Reich Security Head Office in policies within the <coughs> German Empire itself, with the rise of Himmler's own SS Empire and the place, position of other larger SS and police units. Um, if, and, and also various civilian, civilian and military offices that had incorporated Jews into work projects in Poland and so on and so forth. 
if there could be, this all compromised Heydrich's earlier leadership on the Jewish problem. Now, if there could be competition to solve the so-called problem of Jews under German rule in ever more radical and immediate ways, one way of reframing the problem was expanding the geographical scope of the whole policy according to quite ordinary imperatives of organizational life. Growth, innovation, seizing the moment, right? Now, of course, there were limits to Heydrich's and Luther's predictive powers. For only a few months after Heydrich's death in mid-1942, with German military setbacks, uh, and especially with the defeat at Stalingrad at the end of the year, the earlier so-called multiplier effect of reciprocal inter-Jewish state policy was cancelled out. Germany's allies became more aware of their increased leverage over Germany as the Allied powers looked like, looked like likely arbiters of the peace. Jews without full citizenship status were sometimes used as pawns in this changing dynamic, both to placate Germany and out of the opportunism of the states concerned in removing their so-called foreigner problems. Increasingly, though, as in France, full Jewish citizens of various states were not surrendered. Romania was happy to murder and let die the Jews of Bessarabia, Bukovina and Transnistria, but the great majority of Jews of the Regat, Moldavia and Wallachia uh, were neither murdered nor surrendered. Bulgaria deported the Jews of newly acquired Macedonia and Thrace in March 1943, but surrendered no Jew from what was called Old Bulgaria. Along with Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria certainly still felt they had a Jewish question to solve, but they now sought to solve it in ways that would not attract Allied criticism and might even gain favour. Antonescu de de declared that emigration was now an appropriate solution for Romania. The evacuation to Palestine was one op option in this direction, internal deportation another. For the states themselves, as when 20,000 Bulgarian Jews were deported from Sofia to the provinces, it was also a very useful way of appropriating the property and businesses of Jews forced to move. Regional geopolitics could also function as a restraint, just as it had earlier functioned to exacerbate genocide. Romania cooled towards the right not just because of the changing war situation and its own military sacrifices, but because of its frustration over a desired resolution of the Transylvanian question with Hungary. There was actually very little that Germany could do about the reluctance of states as long as they were on the same side supplying resources and manpower. Um, in terms of the overall German state agenda at war, as important as the principle of genocide out of the direct, outside of the direct German sphere of control was using the complicity of other states in genocide as a way of binding them to the German war effort. Um, in a way similar to which the news about the final solution was increasingly leaked to the domestic German population in the attempt to create a community of fate, the Schicksalgemeinschaft. But matters could not be pushed too hard with allies on whom Germany was relying materially. And here I come to my very final comments. Thus, on the 5th of April 1943, the German legation in Sofia remained sanguine in concluding that under the circumstances, it said the deportation of the 11,000 Jews of Thrace and Macedonia must be considered satisfactory. No Jews of old Bulga Bulgaria will be deported. In January 1943, Himmler had concluded that the Romanian government was unmovable and proposed the removal, removal of the Jewish advisor from Germany's Bucharest embassy. Outside the areas of direct German rule, the only thing that could alter the deportation situation was changes in the war situation that brought new areas under direct German control. The Allied invasion of Italy and subsequent Italian armistice um, in September 1943 did precisely that. What autumn 1943 also provided was the conclusion of the murder of Polish and Soviet Jewry, except those who had been drawn into the SS concentration camp system and could thus be killed at will. And we're talking about autumn 93. This is also the time of Himmler's famous Posen speeches that I mentioned earlier. And that development, the near completion of the murder of the of Polish and Soviet Jewry, was a vital context for the boasts that Himmler was coming out with at, at Posen. That Himmler should have been celebrating about effectively finishing the job in October 1943 is only surprising with the hindsight that tells of the occupation of Hungary in 1944. Um, but the Hungarian deportations were the part of the international genocide that in some sense hinged most on contingency. In other words, they might well not have happened. The German invasion of Hungary uh, with a relatively small force in March 1944, opened up a hither clo hitherto closed field. In six weeks from mid-May mid 1944, 438,000 Jews were deported, most to Auschwitz. Uh, and at the height of that process of, of genocide, up to 12,000 people were being murdered per day in Birkenau. 
The prospect of deporting Jews was not, however, a significant factor in the military's decision to go into Hungary. The Allied push into Italy and the Soviet advance through Ukraine had led the Hungarian leadership into considering Allied peace overtures. From Germany's perspective, this would have meant the loss of an important ally and raw materials, hence the invasion and German occupation. But despite occupation, the issue of different regional categories of Hungarian Jews was not rendered immaterial, nor was the cooperation of a large number of willing Hungarian ethnic cleansers guaranteed under all circumstances, especially as regards the large Jewish population of the capital, Budapest, and its hinterlands. The country was divided into different deportation zones. The first and largest deportations to take place were from the carpatho ruthenian re region taken from Czechoslovakia in 1938 and from northern Transylvania taken from Romania in 1940. Around 290,000 of the 438,000 deportees of the summer of 1944 came from those regions. Some 16,000 Jews from the Batska and Baranya areas Hungary had taken from Yugoslavia were also handed over. Why then, in conclusion, my final remarks, why did the deportations end before Hungary was made to di disgorge even all of the citizens of so-called Trianon, Hungary? Well, because the balance of alliance politics, the geopolitical balance, if you like, was about to shift again as Romania defected to the Allied side on the 23rd of August 1944. Now Hungary had missed its own opportunity for defection to the Allies, it re-emphasized its alliance commitment to Germany. It saw the opportunity, perhaps a less, less desperate grab, to gain territory at Romania's expense during the war, and by the same token, to defend its own Transylvanian gains against a revisionist Romania. On the 25th of August, now Hungary had seemingly bound itself to Germany in the war effort again, and in knowledge of Budapest's apprehension about protests from the out outside world, and Budapest's determination now that internal deportation of Jews is the way forward, in knowledge of all of that, on the 25th of August, Himmler forbade further deportations. Notwithstanding horrific aftermaths in, in Hungary itself from October onwards, the genocide of the Hungarian Jews was therefore not brought to completion. As though to the members of the Hungarian administration involved in targeting Jews in 1944, the next year they would find themselves employed in a new program, program this time evicting Hungary's ethnic Germans, realigning themselves with the new post-war order uh, the order of the victorious allies. They took advantage of a new opportunity for ethnic cleansing. Uh, that's in some sense part of the same story, but it's not, not part of the same story for today. Thank you all very much.